This is one of a series of eight films featuring some of the early pioneers of quality improvement in the NHS, who share their personal stories and the practical wisdom gained from leading improvement when it was still a niche activity. The idea for the films was originally conceived during a conversation between Peter Wilcock and Helen Bevan about capturing the legacy of early improvement leaders, and it was given life by the publication of the National Framework for Action on Improvement and Leadership Development. I've been privileged to have met all of the leaders featured in this series of films early on in my own improvement career, and so I found it fascinating hearing their reflections as they look back on their experiences. We hope that their stories will make a powerful contribution, not only to those of you implementing the new national framework, but to everyone aspiring to improve healthcare. Can you um, tell us some of your first experiences of leading service change? My first job, actually, uh, as a clinical psychologist in 1973, was in a, a hospital with a locked ward for children with profound learning disabilities and uh, very challenging behaviours. Uh, and that's when I first realised that things had to change. That was a time when the civil rights movement was very strong. And in particular for learning disabilities, there had been quite a lot of scandals of hospitals not caring properly for their patients. So I was very driven uh, by the need to develop services that were respectful of the needs of the people for whom they were providing care. Uh, that, that, what that meant was that we needed in this ward to really redesign the entire way that it worked, change all the processes, retrain the staff, uh, and also change the way it interacted with the rest of the hospital. So that was very exciting stuff, uh, very heady stuff, uh, and where I made lots of mistakes. So I learned a lot there as well. Okay, so tell us if some of your lessons from that early part of your career, lessons that have stayed with you. Well, the uh, one I still remember very, very clearly was uh, showing a film of new intervention techniques with children like this to all the school teachers uh, in, in the school one lunchtime thinking this was a, going to be a real road to Damascus revolution. Uh, and at the end of it all, there was total silence. Uh, and then the deputy head stood up and said, Peter, so what you're saying is that what we're doing is no good. Uh, I had no idea how to respond to that, because implicitly that's exactly what I was saying. So that was a huge lesson to me about respecting the people that I work with. The, uh, I also had experiences with other staff in the hospital, uh, which I won't go into uh, in detail, but uh, mainly because I was really uh, trying too hard to change things and change people without realising that it was wrong. And just uh, perhaps in time, I heard a very uh, good paper by someone called Nick Georgiadis, who is Professor of Occupational Psychology at Birkbeck University, uh, about the role of the hero, or the myth, I should say, of the hero innovator. And I suddenly realised that's what I was trying to be, uh, trying to be rushing around on my charger with my sword glinting in the sun uh, and upsetting everybody as I went. I, I didn't realise it at the time, uh, but that proved, out, proved to be a real crucible of, of an apprenticeship in quality improvement. And I learned some lessons that I've carried with me throughout my entire working life since then. Uh, the first and most important one was the need to concentrate actually on the children's needs, not just ch change processes for their own sake. And that got the staff very engaged because they were making a real difference to the children. And we were able to measure those differences uh, over time to see how they were, they were gaining skills that they actually didn't have before. So that was really important. The other lesson was very much about, uh, and I was amazed by, the commitment of the staff, the energy of the staff, once they were given a real opportunity to make a difference and to change things, uh, and how they took it on board, uh, and the importance of team working. And we created small teams working with nominated children, so they got to know the children very well uh, and were able to design programmes to help them, them develop. So that was really a very important uh, piece of learning as well. Uh, and the other piece of learning I've already refer referred to is the, the myth of the hero innovator. Don't be one. And I've tried very hard not to be one ever since.
So when did you first learn about quality improvement methods and how did you get involved in QI? When I moved to Winchester Health Authority as district psychologist, and that was in 1981, I had the strategic lead for the learning disability services there as well. And at that same time, I had a friend who worked in the private sector who had just done TQM. And we were talking about it, and that was about in 1989. And it suddenly occurred to me that that's what we were sort of doing uh, to our learning disability service, but without having a name for it. Uh, and so I learned a bit more about that. Uh, and then at the same time, our, our district general manager was developing a broader quality improvement initiative uh, for the whole district. And when he heard about what we were doing for learning disability, asked me to take the lead for that. Uh, so I, I, I agreed and I did that. Um, and we became a, a national TQM demonstration site uh, in about 1990 which was very important because we were able to link to quite a lot of other services around the country and start learning from how they were doing things as well. <laughs> what was quite interesting was pretty much everywhere was doing it differently, but calling it the same thing. So that was quite important learning. Um, and then 1991, um, I became Director of Quality uh, for the, the, the whole district and gave up my job as district psychologist. It felt quite scary. Um, but it, I decided that's the way I wanted my career to move. Uh, and read Don Berwick's uh, paper, the Bad Apples paper, you know, which is the famous paper that's considered to have started to change the way people viewed uh, quality improvement. Got in touch with him, uh, was invited by him to visit him in the States, which I did, uh, and spent a few weeks over there doing the intensive training programs that, that they ran. This was before IHI, just before IHI. Uh, which was something of an epiphany for me because I suddenly realised there's principles, there's methods, there's science to all this, which I then brought back with me uh, to, to the health district. Uh, and we started setting up improvement teams using a much more scientific approach uh, than we had done so previously, uh, which, was, which worked very well. So in the mid-1990s, you began to meet and team up with other people who were um, taking a pioneering role in quality improvement work. Can you tell us a bit about that period? And the 1990s was a really pioneering decade, but there were two parallel worlds. The national emphasis, and indeed in Winchester the regional emphasis, was on clinical audit, which was de rigueur. Uh, and I well remember on one occasion bumping into our senior audit facilitator in the hospital, coming out of an audit meeting with orthopaedics, uh, virtually in tears. She had presented them with an audit report, uh, and she had been told to destroy it and count the copies. Uh, which gives you some idea of the, the fear that that put into the system. Um, and I was also a member of an NHSE, NHSE advisory group uh, on improving quality in primary care, which is where I first met John Oldham, uh, and in fact Martin, a GP called Martin Lawrence, who sadly died, but was one of the early pioneers as well. Uh, and we produced a very radical report as with people like John and I and Martin, you'd expect, uh, that got presented up the line uh, where not only was it suppressed, we were disbanded. Uh, so that, that gives some idea of the sort of climate there was around at that time as we were trying to change the way things were happening. So you've got the world of clinical audit and you also talked about a, 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 an emerging world around quality improvement. Tell us a bit about how that strand developed. Yes, that was very vestigial in the early 1990s. Um, and uh, I was very uh, fortunate to be uh, in at the beginning of that and met some great people. And I think it's important to mention that there, even at the Department of Health, there were one or two really very brave people uh, who, despite the clinical audit focus, were really supporting us. And one person in particular, called Pat Arry, uh, worked very quietly in the background to support us in what we were trying to do. Uh, that was also the, the time of business process re-engineering uh, and I met Peter Homer and Helen Bevan at uh, the LRI where I actually got some insight again into how you can uh, address whole systems. I think it's also worth mentioning the British Deming Association which was very active in those days and had a health uh, sort of section where we were being introduced to the Deming approach to leadership uh, and, and improvement which had a very powerful influence on me. Uh, and I like to sometimes think of that time as a shift from Don Abadian uh, to, to Deming. 
uh, which uh, Donna Bagent had done the work on which much uh, uh, really good work had been based. But there was a shift in culture to the ideas of leadership being very important, not simply measuring structure, process and outcomes. So what were some of your key learning from that period, during the modernisation agency period? Well, the first lesson is, and we learned this quite early, that time spent on quality improvement has to be an investment, not an overhead. It has to produce results, otherwise why would anybody be involved in it? And in particular, it has to produce results that are benefit to the patients. So that's, that's my first lesson. The second uh, lesson, I think, is that stories of successful improvement are always success stories of, of people working together and learning together. Um, so we're bringing together two dimensions there. Firstly is the idea of interprofessional working and secondly is the idea of interprofessional learning. And CQI lends itself to both those because you can't do successful uh, quality improvement without using teams and without using learning methodology. The other, and I think a profound lesson, is the fact that the power to do improvement already lies within the staff. Mm -hmm. It's not recognised often by the powers that be. And the challenge then is how the powers, be the managers and higher up than managers, can actually create opportunities for staff to do what they want to do, which is to make things better for their patients. The IHI, though, was really important. It provided a fantastic uh, uh, resource to those of us who were struggling over here. And these annual forums uh, you could attend where you met with all sorts of people who were doing quality improvements and you realised you weren't quite so alone in the world. And there was a small British contingent uh, used to go over uh, for that annual uh, battery recharging. Uh, at that time, in 1994, I was uh, asked by Richard Smith to join him at a meeting to think about whether we might be able to run something similar over here. And out of that uh, came the idea of the European Forums, and the first one was held in 1996. That was very exciting, and they're still going now, and, and have risen from three or four hundred people to many thousands, which is now the International Forum, of course. The other strand to my work during the 1990s was with Bournemouth University, where my old chief executive had moved as dean. Uh, of an Institute of Health and Community Studies. Uh, and we focus very much on two things really, how to do quality improvement in practice and how to help uh, professional staff learn to do quality improvement in practice, both very important strands. Our very early work uh, was in primary care, interestingly, uh, with a number of practices. And I still feel quite proud uh, that one of the projects I worked uh, in uh, with a, a GP called Sue Cox uh, was, I think, one of the very first papers published in this country describing quality improvement in practice. Uh, and towards the end of the 1990s, uh, the movement, I think, had grown to the point where, which led to the establishment of the Modernisation Agency uh, in the early 2000s, about 2000 or 2001, where David Fillingham uh, came in to lead that and where I first met him. And I think Modernisation modernization Agency um, started to have a fantastic impact on and supporting the development of improvement in the NHS. So in terms of that um, part of your quality improvement journey, what are you most proud of? Two particular things stand out uh, for me. One was work with Jean Penny, uh, where we were looking at how to build the learning of quality improvement skills into undergraduate education. Our work up until then had actually been with teams uh, of, of already qualified staff and we began to realise that they lacked any knowledge of quality improvement or any experience because they'd never been taught as undergraduates. And we discovered that even undergraduates using uh, uh, work-based learning approaches could actually create real improvement in practice settings uh, as they learned the skills in their uh, part of their training. A really important dimension of that was we tried to make it interprofessional so that we were bringing students together from different professions to learn about improvement uh, and, and by doing improvement at the same time. The second uh, piece of work I feel very proud of uh, was what was called uh, developing discovery interviews. Uh, and that was uh, an, an idea that uh, was triggered by Helen Bevan, interestingly. We'd had a conversation about how could we change from just simply doing patient satisfaction after care to actually trying to develop improvement based on understanding of needs before care. 
uh, and she suggested we might work with the CHD Collaborative, uh, which I did, and David Rose and Sheila Machen uh, were leading that piece of work and were, were absolutely fantastic, where we actually recorded patients telling their stories of their illness, not of their care, not making any judgments at all, but simply talking about their illness. Uh, and we then were able to play these back to the clinical teams who've been providing that care. When we fed the stories back to clinical teams, uh, we found that they were very inspired by what they heard, and it was a fantastic driver for improvement. Still thinking about uh, what I feel proud of more broadly, if I look back over my career, uh, I get a sense of great satisfaction from the fact that I think there are people doing improvement now and teams doing improvement now uh, who have developed an understanding that they are improvers and they need to do improvement, not just simply they have to do projects. So in 2007 you became Director of Service Improvement at Salisbury Foundation Trust. What did you do differently there? What lessons from your earlier improvement experiences did you apply? Well, the first one was about understanding the organisation as a system uh, and trying to work at all levels of the system so that even from board level down to the front line, we had some sort of connection going on so that the work being done at the front line uh, was a priority for the hospital. Uh, I won't say for one second that we actually got that perfect, but we started to think about doing that. And in a similar vein, uh, the idea of looking at service planning, which was going on all the time, uh, but service planning as a quality improvement planning process, not simply service planning process. I think the importance of that work was very much about how do we embed quality improvement within the way we do things around here, whether it's the way we always reflect as teams about what we're doing and how we could do it better, or how we build it into ordinary everyday education so that people are learning these skills and they become improvers as well as practitioners and see that as part of their uh, way of working. The, and one example of that, uh, that where well, we did some work with our first year foundation doctors, uh, which was very much about how could we build into them understanding of quality improvement at the very beginning of their careers so that they could be using those skills throughout their careers as well as with us. Um, and we had an action learning based approach to this where at the very beginning of their stay in the hospital they all had to undertake improvement projects in small groups based on priorities that had already been uh, agreed by the hospital as important and they spent their first year being facilitated to run these improvement projects uh, and they were fantastic uh, and there's no doubt that it changed certainly for some of them the way they looked at their work and their ideas about their future careers. What's helped you keep personally resilient? That's a very good question because like anybody else who'd been involved in the work like I have, will tell you you have your good times and you have your very bad times sometimes. Uh, the thing that kept me going all the time uh, was a very deeply held set of values about improving patient care from right from my learning disability days back in 1973 uh, alongside a recognition that anything we do has to make an, uh, a demonstrable difference to the people for whom we actually are doing it. Uh, and when you see those changes happening, even in the bad times, that gives you hope. Something else that's been a constant strand right throughout my quality improvement work has been taking inspiration from the teams with whom I've been working. Uh, they have always been fantastic. They've always shown that they really want to do improvement uh, if only someone had actually, A, given them the opportunity, and B, given them some ideas about how they could possibly do it. So I saw very much what I was doing was providing people with opportunities that they actually desperately wanted. Uh, and I had learned I didn't need to do anything to them, but I simply needed to be there to help them. Uh, and they would go way beyond the call of duty uh, in actually making improvements to, to the services they provided for their patients. And I always found that sort of very inspirational. I think the final thing I would say is rather more personal, which is about look after yourself. Uh, I think we don't do that well enough uh, and we suffer for it. And I think the, the hero innovator bit gets in the way here because we feel we shouldn't be weak. We shouldn't need help, but we do. And my advice to other people has always been, if you're going to start this journey, uh, you need to make sure you build in your own support systems. 
Uh, and I remember uh, well Don Berwick uh, making a point many years ago uh, that you can't afford to have an ego and if you want to lead quality improvement. That's certainly true, but you do need to make sure you have people who will support you.